Hey, grade 12 learners of South Africa, welcome to Mindset. We're going to be doing life sciences for the next hour and 15 minutes or so. We're going to be looking at sexual reproduction in plants and animals. All right, so we start off with, first of all, male and female. There must be a male and a female when we have sexual reproduction. And what are we going to end up with? Haploid gametes from both the male and the female produced by meiosis. Now this is all revision, you know this, all right? The process of fertilization takes place, so we add the one gamete plus the other gamete and we end up with a diploid, means two, diploid zygote. All right, now that zygote develops into an embryo, even in plants, and it contains the genes. In other words, the genetic characteristics from both the male and the female. All right, now, we're going to always have less offspring when there is sexual reproduction. Why? Because it will depend on how many ovules the female has. In humans, generally, we have one, okay? Um, in seeds, plants can produce thousands of seeds, but compared to asexual reproduction or vegetative reproduction, we can end up with a lot of offspring that are identical to the parent, all right? And there are many. We can just carry on. As long as there's a parent, uh, a parent plant, we can make as many offspring as we like. Whereas with sexual reproduction, it is finite. All right, now, the advantages. You have a recombination. Now, please, people, look at this word. You recombine. A recombination of the chromosomes during meiosis. All right? And it is random fusion of the gametes during fertilization and that results in offspring that have genetic variation. Okay, now remember with um, genetics, if we've got the, the parent, I'm going to just put capital B, small b and we have um, the two parents, we're always going to have a recombination of options of gametes that will end up or, or uh, sorry, genes that will end up in the offspring because the offspring can either be that or this or this or that. So it's always a recombination and a random fusion of the, of, of the gametes. Why? So that we can have genetic variation. That is your biggest plus with regard to um, sexual reproduction. There is always room for genetic variation. Even you, as you sit there, you are half your mother and half your father. Theoretically, you are a quarter of each of your grandparents, but there is always a genetic variation when sexual reproduction takes place. Asexual reproduction, there is no genetic variation. All right, now, if we look here at the disadvantages, the male and female gametes must be um, prevented from fusing or they can be prevented from fusing so no offspring can be produced whereas with asexual reproduction a plant's going to make offspring um, genetic mutations may result in undesired characteristics being carried to the offspring so your disadvantages are that they may be prevented from fusing so there's no offspring and secondly we are going to have genetic mutations occurring as well whereas when there is asexual reproduction, there is no genetic variation, so there is no chance of a mutation. Right, now, asexual reproduction is what we're going to go through now. And this, people, you must know. So, here we're always going to have one parent. It's asexual. You only need two when there is sexual. When it is asexual, it doesn't matter. You've got the one parent that's going to keep producing offspring that are identical. So here we're going to need vegetative structures. In other words, it grows from, so in the, this case it would be plants, okay? And it's going to grow by mitosis, no meiosis. Meiosis is for sexual reproduction. Just remember, meiosis 
S's, lots of S's. Okay, mitosis, if my toes grow, my shoes get too small for me. Mitosis is for growth, for development, for growth and development, for replacement of cells, okay, to repair cells, and also for reproduction in unicellular organisms. Okay, that's mitosis. Now, here you've got a plant that's going to make a vegetative structure and undergo mitosis. There is no fertilization and the resulting offspring are going to be deployed and people look at this, identical. They are identical to their parent plant. All right, because there's no reproduction. It's like cloning. There's, it's rapid. You can get lots of numbers quickly. The advantage is it's ideal for large numbers of identical offspring. And why would we want identical offspring? Because they have the desired genetic characteristics that we want. And disadvantages? Well, the biggest just disadvantage is that there is no genetic variation. Even though the advantage is that we have desirable genetic characteristics, but always no genetic variation, so there'll never be any difference. If we look at asexual reproduction in flowering plants, um, you must remember it's quick and they're identical. And those are your two strongest points here. We're going to look at stems. Now the different stems, we have rhizomes, okay? And rhizomes are underground stems, so you have the new plant growing up from there. Tubers, well, they stems that store food, like, for example, potatoes, and we all love potatoes. If you've ever seen in a, um, a bag of potatoes, if you leave the bag for a long time, um, let's say over a week or two, it's a nice, dark, warm place. So in that bag, it sort of represents the soil. And when we get to the sort of bottom of the bag, if you don't eat a lot of potatoes, um, you'll see that some of the potatoes have like a little bud growing from them. It's called an eye. All right, that's the term. And that little bud, if you cut a piece of potato with that bud and you plant it, it'll grow into a new plant. All right, so you have your lateral buds, and if you cut them, clearly it grows into a new potato. Now, other stems are bulbs, and people, we all know what onions look like. Now, if you leave onions and you don't, I mean, if you buy a big bag of onions and you don't eat a lot of onions, um, the last few in that bag, you'll find that the bulb, the onion plant, has now started producing little baby plants on the side of it. And it will also start to grow green leaves out of it. Then that plant is ready to stick into the ground, or the onion's ready to stick into the ground. And any one of those little bits that develop from the side, you can break them off and they grow into new onions as well. Stolons, they're also called runners. This we're always going to find in strawberry plants. Um, there's also hen and chicken, um, but we'll show you later. So we have a horizontal stem that grows sideways, and, and as it grows out of the little plant, the stolon grows along, and where it hits the soil, it develops into a new little plant with roots, and then it'll produce another one and a new little plant and roots. All right. Now, if we look at stems and se asexual reproduction, here you have your underground stems. All right, can you see? From this stem, you're going to have roots developing and you have leaves developing. So this is an underground stem. And it's called a rhizome. All right, and here we've got sweet potatoes and normal potatoes. These are tubers. All right, and if you look here, there is an eye, and there's an eye, and here's another eye. If you cut this piece of potato like that, and you stick it into the ground, every one of these eyes will develop into a new plant, and those plants will be identical to the original plant. All right, and here we've got the onion, and um, the onion is a bulb. And what it does is it starts to grow out like that, and as it starts to grow these green leaves, you'll find that a little bulby area will develop here, and it'll start to have its own leaves. You can break that off and stick it into the ground, or you can take this one and stick it into the ground. And here we have our stolon or runners.
okay there's the original strawberry plant and the runner runs along here I'm going to do it in blue so you can see it nicely and where it lands it starts to grow roots and the little stems and leaves develop and then this one develops a new one and that one develops a new one and so you have all these runners running along okay in leaves how do leaves reproduce vegetatively um, they produce little plant lits along the leaf margin so remember if that's the leaf this here is the margin of the leaf so they'll develop little plantlets here and when the little plantlets get too big they will drop off and fall onto the ground and start growing and this is because of meristematic tissue now remember meristematic tissue is the growth tissue all right and then the new little leaves are there then vegetative reproduction in roots now you must remember some roots have things called suckers and those suckers develop into adventitious buds and each bud will then grow above the ground so the sucker grows into roots at the base and the stem and examples of that are going to be your apple trees cherry trees raspberry plants and blackberry plants that's why if you plant one raspberry in your garden you're going to find that within one season you're going to end up with about 40 or 50 raspberry plants growing okay here's a picture of or a, a photo of a kalenko it's a um, succulent and there this there's the little leaflet growing on the margin because remember this is the margin of the leaf and they will grow on the margin of the leaf when they get too heavy they drop onto the ground and they already have roots and a stem and leaves and they can grow all right people when we look at life cycles we are always going to have alternation of generations now you say that and people think whoa hold on hold on sure this is a huge term it's not to alternate means if I have black and white and black and white I'm alternating between black and white okay so alternating means to go from one to the next okay and then back to the first and back to the next so that's alternating okay generations we have a sporophyte which produces spores and a gametophyte which is going to produce what come on a gametophyte will produce gametes so what we're saying is within a life cycle there's going to be an alternation between sporophyte generation and gametophyte generation now we are the sporophyte but what happens in the ovaries and the testes we produce gametes so that would be that portion would be the gametophyte generation and then the gametes will bond and form a diploid zygote and what do we have then we have the sporophyte generation so the sporophyte generation is always diploid and the gametophyte generation is always haploid so let's have a look alternation of generations okay you are alternating between the haploid gametes and the diploid sporophyte generation okay so each phase has one distinct structure we have a gametophyte generation that is haploid and a sporophyte generation which is diploid now a haploid plant if it's haploid has a gametophyte generation and that will produce gametes I mean people really this is not difficult gametophyte there's your word gamete okay so gametophyte produces gametes and how do you produce gametes here by mitosis because the the mother section is a gamete and it's haploid so therefore it's going to produce more haploids okay so you're going to have your haploid structure by mitosis because remember it starts off haploid it's going to produce more haploid by mitosis so they are identical the gametes fuse and when they fuse they form a diploid zygote now you must know this by now which grows by mitosis into a diploid sporophyte generation so we have a gametophyte generation that produces gametes by mitosis 
And we now have the gametes, they're going to fuse to form a diploid sporophyte generation. The, spore, the sporophyte generation produces haploid spores by meiosis. So we're going to have diploid, and that's going to produce haploid structures by meiosis because it's reduction division. And then the haploid spores will grow. And when they grow by mitosis, they form the gametophyte generation, which produces the gametes. So it's a cycle. And if we have a look here, let me just put this, oh no. You must understand the cycle. So we start off, let's get different colors here, with the gametophyte generation. All right? So... The, the spores, which are haploid, will go on the ground and they undergo mitosis, so they grow. That grows into the gametophyte generation. The gametophyte generation produces gametes by mitosis. So here we have our gametes, they are haploid. They then fuse during fertilization. The minute those gametes fuse during fertilization, we now end up with the sporophyte generation. It is diploid because it was haploid. You've got haploid plus haploid is going to give you 2N which is diploid. All right, let's get our green back again. So we have a diploid zygote. It undergoes mitosis, Y for growth, and we end up with our sporophyte generation which is diploid all right diploid that undergoes meiosis so it goes from 2n and it's not going to work again so it goes from 2n and it splits into n and n and there we have our spores very very easy really not difficult at all as long as you remember gametophyte generation produces gametes your sporophyte generation produces spores. Okay, people, we're now going to look at alternation of generations and the cycles in the moss and the fern and the flowering plant. Just briefly, don't go and spend hours learning this. Just make sure you understand that when you alternate generations, you go from gametophyte with gametes to a sporophyte, which produces spores. Okay, so alternation of generations in the moss we're going to have the dominant phase is going to be water is essential for photosynthesis, I mean for fertilization. So that's the dominant phase. There must be water because the little sperm cells have to get to the egg cells. And how do they get there? By water. Okay. It's partly parasitic, the sporophyte generation, and develops from the gametophyte generation structures. Now remember, the sporophyte undergoes meiosis to produce spores. So here, your dominant phase is the gametophyte generation. When we look at the fern, it's progressed and it's higher up on the ladder and your dominant phase is your sporophyte generation. Okay, the structure undergoes meiosis and it produces haploid spores. Here, your gametophyte is a separate structure called a thallus. Now, people remember, please, from previous grades, that a thallus is a structure that doesn't really, it has root-like structures. It has um, leaf-like structures. Everything is like. It's not a proper um, root stem or leaf. Okay, it's just a thallus, it's just a basic structure. And it will have rhizoids, not rhizomes. Rhizoids, root-like structures. Okay, so the thallus will have a male section and a female section. It actually looks like this. Okay, and it will produce little rhizoids which will grow down into the ground like root-like structures. And then it's going to have the female structures around here and the male structures around there. Um, it's, and water because this has to be wet, is essential for photos, uh, at least for fertilization to occur. Why? Because the little male gametes must swim to the female gametes and get to the venter, which is a little structure that looks almost like a flower. 
or the inside part of a flower and then the little meat goes in here and it fertilizes the little egg cell which all sit here. All right, so the sporophyte develops from the gametophyte structure. If we look at the flowering plants, here again, your more advanced plants, your dominant phase will always be the sporophyte phase. So here we have uh, various adaptations exist. Why? Because we must make sure pollination takes place. And then your fruit and your seeds are produced, which grow into a new sporophyte generation. All right? On the sporophyte generation, you'll have your gametophyte structures. And here, your male and female, male and female are parts of the sporophyte. If you look at, um, let's take a rose. We all know what roses look like, okay? They're also the flowers of love and happiness and wada wada wada. Okay, so we have the rose plant. We've got the plant is a sporophyte generation. On that plant, we have a flower or a bud that develops into a flower. And the gametophyte structures develop on the flower, which is still a sporophyte structure. And then on there, we'll have the ovary with the egg cells, and we'll have the anthers and the stamen, or the stamen and the anther, which then produces the male parts, okay, and the pollen grains, which contains the male gametes. So here, your dominant structure is your sporophyte, and your gametophyte structure will have the male and female parts, and where gametes will be produced, fertilization results in a diploid zygote, which develops into an embryo. That embryo is encased in the seeds, and that will then grow into the sporophyte generation. Okay, now we're going to look at metamorphosis in insects. Now, this also is a life cycle. Remember, you had your life cycles or your alternation of generations in your moss and your fern and your um, flower producing plants. Here we're going to look at insects and their metamorphosis. Now, to morph means to change. So metamorphosis, we are changing what we look like. Um, very often in figurative speech, as far as humans are concerned, we'll say, sure, she underwent a complete metamorphosis. Um, she no longer is sort of chubbyish and whatever, and she's had her teeth straightened, she's got braces, she's undergone a metamorphosis. We change, we change as we grow anyway, as we grow older. We change. The things we like when we're 50 is not the same as we liked when we were 10. Okay, people, so metamorphosis means to change. It's an abrupt transition or change from one development stage to another. Okay, here we're looking at external appearance. So in insects, it's a physical change. Now, if you look at an egg that hatches, versus a larva and then an adult. That's metamorphosis. The body is changed as cells grow and differentiate to adapt to the changes in the habitat and behavior. Now, think about this. Um, many of, of, of you out there have had silkworms at some other stage of your lives. And we get the silkworms and their little eggs. And the little eggs hatch, and as soon as they hatch, we have to feed them mulberry or lettuce leaves. Um, and if you feed them beetroot, they spin pink silk. And it's true. It's not a fallacy. It's real. Okay. So you feed them all the leaves. You can't mix them. You've got to stick to one type of food. And you keep giving them their food. And those worms eat. And they eat. And they eat. And they eat. And then one day, you have a look in your box. And there are no worms left. They've all formed cocoons. All right? And you leave the box, you forget about it, and one day you'll hear flap, 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 and you open the box, and there you have all these very ugly moths. And that is your metamorphosis. That's complete metamorphosis. It's gone through four stages. It's gone from an egg to a larva, which is the worm, to a pupa, and then from that pupa, out emerges from this ugly worm, you end up with the moth or a butterfly. So that would be metamorphosis. So let's look at complete. Complete, it has to have four life stages. It goes from the egg to the larva, which is the worm, to the pupa, which is when it makes that thick shell around itself, 
to the adult. And the adult's also called the imago. And the adult would either be a moth or a butterfly. So the embryo develops into, in the egg. And it hatches into a larva, which is the caterpillar, the worm, and that eats. So this here is the eating stage. That's what it's there for. Its mouth parts, everything are developed to eat. The larva then enters into the pupa stage. So when it's eaten enough and it's grown enough, it then it sleeps. It actually has a long little chill time. It sleeps inside a crystallis. The crystallis is that shell that it, it develops on the outside of the pupa. Then the body changes physically inside and it goes from being this long, ugly worm. So it goes from looking like this, with lots of little legs, okay? It goes from that into something that looks like this. Now, I mean, that is a complete change, okay? And it can only reproduce in this stage because its function here, okay, as a, as a caterpillar, its function is to eat. And its function here is to mate. And when it mates, it produces eggs. And when it lays its eggs, we're ready to start the life cycle again. And examples of this would be bees and moths and butterflies and mosquitoes and dragonflies and flies. They all go through metamorphosis okay what is the advantage well first of all the juvenile <coughs> and the adult f forms live in different habitats okay the worm is going to live on leaves and eat those leaves butterflies or the adults move away they don't live in the same habitat so therefore they require different fo food sources this avoids competition which is good you don't want competition between the same uh, uh, um, stages of one organism. Um, and also the pupa stage, there's no feeding at all. So the, a, food, a food shortage won't worry it at all. So your pupa stage normally ends up during autumn or winter. So that that little moth or butterfly sleeps during a period where there is no food. What happens mainly in winter? Your deciduous trees are going to lose all their leaves. And there's nothing for the pupa, for at least for the larva to eat. So the larva eats during summer. It forms the pupa stage during winter. And in springtime, out come the butterflies or the moths. They mate, they lay their eggs, their eggs um, get ready to hatch. And then when it's uh, spring, at least get to summertime, they will hatch. Because why? During summer, there is plenty of food. All right, so the pupa covers, is covered and protected, and it can, it can stay like that and look after the organism in harsh, unfavorable environmental conditions. So that's good. The disadvantages are that the organism is defenseless while it's in its pupa stage. So the pupal stage is protecting it from harsh, unfavorable environmental conditions, but if there's something that wants to eat it, it can't protect itself. It's defenseless. Okay, the difference between complete and incomplete. Remember, complete metamorphosis had egg, larva, pupa, and then adult. Always those four. With incomplete metamorphosis, you're only going to have three life stages. An egg, a nymph, and an adult, which is the imago. Now, the nymph doesn't look like a worm at all. All right, it's just a very small version of the adult, but it doesn't have wings and it doesn't have all kinds of things. So we're going to look at this now. The nymph office looks, often looks similar to the adult. Okay, you think of cockroaches, locusts, toads, and frogs. But your nymph, for example, in locusts, can't fly. The advantages, the nymph has adaptive features to allow it to live in a different habitat. Therefore, it's going to eat different food. And therefore, we don't have competition between the young or the nymphs and the adults. Now, people, that is the same as we had for uh, um, complete metamorphosis. So that advantage is the same. So you only have to learn one advantage. But the disadvantage is that the nymph must grow and molt. 
Okay, so as it grows, it goes through seven different stages of molting. So what is molting? Molting is uh, when it sheds its extra, remember these are insects. So they have a head, a thorax, and the soft abdomen. The thorax is hard, it's made of chitin most times. And chitin is, is hard and thick. And I mean, if you've ever s squashed um, a cockroach, you know it goes crunch, crunch, crunch. That's the exoskeleton breaking. All right, now, if this little thing has to grow, it's got this hard exoskeleton. It's got to break through that exoskeleton, shed it, which is molting, and then while it's shedding it, the soft underneath is going to be all wet and soft. And this little thing, this poor little nymph, is going to then not be able to fly or do anything. It can't because its whole exoskeleton is wet. It has to wait for it to dry. So during that period, it's going to be vulnerable and it can be eaten. So during molting, the organism cannot move until the, the exoskeleton is completely dry. So it's vulnerable. It can be eaten. Okay, here we have a question. It's question one. The diagram below represents the life cycle of a butterfly. Or my daughter, when she was little, used to call it a flutterby. So we have our flutterby, our butterfly. Let's have a look. First thing when you get a diagram, people always, you have a look. One, what is that? That's the adults. Okay. Two, well, clearly those are eggs. I mean, you really don't have to be Einstein to figure this one out. Okay. That there would be the larva or the the caterpillar and this stage here is the pupa stage pupil stage okay this is when it is a pupa so this thing is a pupa and it's in the pupil stage larval stage or it is a larva and the adult Okay, let's have a look at the questions. Name the type of metamorphosis shown in the diagram. Explain your answer. Well, clearly it is complete metamorphosis. Okay, and being complete metamorphosis, why? Explain your answer. Um, all the stages of development. Development are present. Okay, label the stages. We've done that. And then it says explain the major difference between the complete and incomplete metamorphosis. All right. If we look at complete, I would always do a table. Now they haven't asked for a table. When they ask for a table in an exam, if they say tabulate the differences, then you know you're going to get a mark for doing the table, an extra mark. But whenever you are asked to um, explain or show the differences, it's always better to do it in table form because then you don't forget anything. So if we look here, we say complete metamorphosis and we have incomplete. All right, now, complete, we're going to say that the organism changes completely. Now, this completely is an important term. Physically, I mean, it, it's important to say that. Physically, all right, during four stages. All right, and what are those four stages? They're going to be the adult. We need the adult first. The adult lays the eggs. The eggs hatch and grow into the larva, which is the main eating stage. The larva will then become a pupa, and the pupa will then emerge as the adult, or there's another term for it, an imago. So whichever term your teacher is teaching you, they're both correct. For incomplete metamorphosis, we're going to have organisms change gradually. See, it's not complete, it's gradually physically. 
during three stages. And those three stages are egg and the nymph and the adult. Adult or imago. So three stages versus four changes gradually. Here it changes completely. Okay, people, easy enough. Okay, now we look at reproductive structures. Now, what are reproductive structures? We're going to look at different groups in the animal kingdom have developed reproductive strategies to ensure reproductive success. Now, what would a strategy be? In class, let's say um, your class is going to do a money drive for um, clothes or, or a, clo a, a, a drive for clothes for people who have nothing. Okay, so you've got to sit down and make a plan of action. That plan of action is what your strategy is. So here we're looking at reproductive strategies for reproductive success. They want to make sure that they're going to be successful. Why is it so necessary to reproduce? Because by reproducing, each organism on this planet is ensuring that its kind survives. All right, now in order for sexual reproduction to take place, we need two individuals. We need a male and a female. Not two males, not two females. Why? Because the male is going to produce the male gamete and the female is going to produce the female gamete. And the two gametes are going to join to form a new organism by fertilization. Okay, so we look at animals and what is courtship. Now what, think about in your life, what is courtship? Remember we are a kind of animal, we're not plants. We are either humans fall into the category of animals on this planet, not plants. So it's plants or animals, that's it, you've got to choose. Okay, look, some people are vegetative structures, but we're not going to go there. Okay, so we look at courtship. And what is courtship? Um, girls, if a guy comes and he knocks you, punches you in the face and grabs you by your hair and drags you along, are you going to be open and receptive to him asking you to be his girlfriend? No. Okay, his behavior is completely wrong. Guys, if you want to woo a girl, what are you going to do? You're going to be nice to her. You're going to do her homework for her maybe. You're going to bring her special lunch or a sweetie or a chockey to school. You are going to woo her. That is courtship. Okay, you're not going to punch her in the face and drag her around by her hair. Okay, that's caveman style, doesn't work. So here, animals are exactly the same. Um, the female, even though in birds, for example, they are quite dull. I mean, the, woman, the females really aren't pretty birds. But the males always look very flashy. Why? Because they're showing themselves off. And the female decides, hmm, I like that one over there because he's got a bright yellow tail, okay, or a bright red tail. Um, or he really looks cool with all these colors. That's how the female chooses. The female always chooses. So the males have to strut around looking good and do all kinds of fancy things to make the female want them. So let's have a look what they do. We're looking at animal species. We have courtships and they are rituals for mate selection and mating. Now, if the female doesn't choose a mate, there's going to be no mating. And she's very, very fussy. So the male will generally initiate courtship, but the female, look at this, selects her mate. And people, we are no different as humans to the animal kingdom. No different whatsoever. So guys, beware. We choose. Isn't it lovely being female? Okay, based on his display. 
The courtship rituals may include complicated dances, soft pecking, head rubs, singing, the birds are going to whistle like anything, noise making, fancy flying patterns, croaking. I mean, have you ever sat in the evening, no matter where you are, and you're sitting there at about six o'clock, seven o'clock in the evening, and you hear quack, 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 and the frogs start going mad. Eventually you think like, are there only frogs and crickets out there? Well, those frogs are calling the females. They're saying, listen to my beautiful voice. Bop. Okay? And the female listens. I don't like that one. And the other one says, well, I've got a better one. Bop. And she thinks, well, not so good. And this one says, oh, I've got a really good one. I can show you a good time. Quack, quack. And she thinks, oh, there we go. That's my mate. And that's how it works in nature. All right, note that courtship rituals can result in behavioral isolation. Because if the female doesn't like that male's croaking, or the mock fighting, or the real fighting, or the displays of good looks like we have with a peacock, she says, well, you know what? Not interested, you're not coming near me. And then we have behavioral isolation, which results in animals behaving different, differently during mating rituals, and the females will not become responsive and if they are not responsive no mating takes place all right now examples of courtship we've got our frogs croaking we've got our male reptiles well they've got nice bright colors and they dance around the female saying uh-huh check out my dance moves doll are you interested and she'll say hmm looks good let's have a look at another dance move and so they choose their partners that way birds singing the peacocks display their tail feathers weaver birds are oh, shame these poor weaver birds people the male goes around and he builds nests and he, he'll choose his female and he builds this beautiful nest. Then he goes and he says to his female, come, come look at my home. Come look at our home. This is going to be our home. And she checks it out. She thinks, mm -mm, not living here, hun. No, 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 no. Not classy enough for me. Go play. And Shane, the poor weaver bird, is distraught, so he's got to build another nest. He goes and gets the female again and says, do you like my nest? He says, not good enough. This is to here and this is to that. And, and he goes, and he, he can build up to five or six nests before the female will accept him and in his prowess of building. So gentlemen, maybe you should all become good builders and you'll have the girls running after you as well. We're going to take a lesson out of the animal world. Mammals, the females come into estrus, they come on heat, that's what estrus is, and they release pheromones. And the pheromones drive the males mad. Now, here's something for you. A male cat can smell a female cat that is on heat up to a thousand meters away. Now, can you believe that? The same applies to dogs, except they're about 500 to 600 meters away. They can smell a female that's on heat. But again, if the female does not like the male, there's nothing he's going to do. She will not allow him to mate with her. And generally, that's what you find when the cats are making this incredible noise outside. It's because the female will not allow the male to come near her because she does not believe he is good and that he will give her the best and strongest offspring. Okay, people, we're now going to external versus internal fertilization, all right? So we say, right, external fertilization, the egg and the sperm fuse outside the female's body. It's external, okay? The eggs are generally inside, the, uh, um, the egg cells are generally inside the egg structures. The females lay her eggs and the male then de deposits his sperm over the eggs. Examples, frogs and many types of fish. Sorry, okay. Hmm? Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, people, we're now going to look at external versus internal fertilization. Now, if external is outside the body, internal is inside the body. Okay, this is very, it's not difficult, it's so easy. Have a look. External fertilization. The egg cells and the sperm fuse outside of the female's body. So what happens? 
We have the egg cells are sitting inside the, stru the egg structures. The females lay their eggs and the male comes and he deposits his sperm over the top. Examples, frogs and many species of fish. Remember that the shell for those eggs, they're not going to have hard shells. It's going to just be like a soft jelly-like substance so the sperm can actually get to the egg. But it happens outside the female body. Internal fertilization, the egg cell fuses with the sperm cell inside the female body. Now, in some fish, most reptiles and all bird species, reproduction is internal. But fertilization is cloacal because the eggs are produced. In mammals, copu that's us, copulation takes place. And this is when the male inserts his penis into the female and the, the sperm is released. Fertilization will take place in the fallopian tubes. And people, this is very important because you're going to do human reproduction. So remember, we are mammals, okay? And in mammals, you're going to have this, the, the, the penis is inserted into the vaginal structure and the sperm is released up into the female and fertilization takes place in the fallopian tubes, not inside the cloaca. All right, now embryo development. Once fertilization has taken place, the diploid, remember it's a diploid zygote, develops into an embryo. This development takes place in an egg or in a uterus. Now, in the uterus, the placenta is going to feed the baby. In the egg, the yolk is going to feed the baby. All right, that little developing embryo. Now, you must know these three terms. Please, please, please learn them off by heart. We have viviparous, oviparous, and ovoviviparous. Now, viviparous, here, the embryo develops inside the uterus. There is a placenta that's going to nourish the baby and the female gives birth to live young. Okay, when the gestation, this is pregnancy, when the gestation period is finished. So viviparous, we are an example of viviparous and our cats and our dogs, all our pets at home are going to be viviparous. Oviparous has an O in front of it. Think of the O as an egg. You know those things that we boil in the morning? Okay, so viviparous is straight in the uterus. Placenta and it gives birth to live young. Oviparous, eggs. And those eggs are going to have shells. And they laid outside the female's body, all right, in a nest or a structure. And it continues to be develop inside the egg and then the egg hatches and we end up with a new little baby coming out of that. Now, if viviparous is giving birth to live young and internal fertilization, oviparous, there's an egg. Now, if we have ovoviviparous, come on people, it's a mixture of the two. So let's see how it combines. Oviviparous, the fertilized eggs remain in the oviduct of the female, okay? So it's in an egg structure but, and there's no placenta. So it's in the egg structure and that little embryo is going to grow and grow and grow and grow until it's big enough in the oviduct. And then when it's ready, the female will give birth to live young. But they stay in the egg in the female. Why? Because the female doesn't have a uterus that can develop a placenta. So viviparous, there's a placenta that feeds that baby in the uterus and it develops and grows and we give birth to live young. Ovoviviparous, the female doesn't have a uteral structure. So what it does have is it has all the structures to produce an egg, the eggs get fertilized and it keeps those eggs in the oviduct. And when the eggs are ready, the babies actually come out of the egg and the female will give birth to the live young and all the eggs the pieces of egg afterwards. But you must remember those eggs are not going to have hard shells like a chicken's egg, for example. Okay, so they have no shell. They can't have a shell, okay? It's just a soft, uh, leathery type structure and there is no placenta. And oviparous, we have a shell. Amniotic eggs. Now an amniotic egg is going to be an egg that actually has all the parts in it. It's not going to be a soft shelled egg, it's a hard shelled egg. It has a porous, leathery or hard eggshell.
and why? It prevents the egg from drying out. There are three membranes. You have the amnion, and you must know this, please. The amnion, and it protects the embryo during development. The chorion, which transfers the nutrients. Okay, so this is your amnions for protection, your chorion is for nutrients, and your allantois. And the allantois is for respiration and for waste disp uh, disposal. Now, your examples here would be insects. The eggs are not amniotic. In fish and amphibians, the eggs are jelly-like without a shell for external fertilization. Otherwise, that poor little sperm cell is never going to get to the egg. In reptiles, we have amniotic eggs that are oviparous. Okay, now remember, reptiles can either be oviparous or ovoviviparous. There are some reptiles that give birth to live young. There are some snakes that give birth to live young. So the eggs were inside the oviduct, they hatch there, the babies, and they actually give birth to live young. All right, and then birds are always amniotic. This is the diagram of an amniotic egg. Please, you must learn this. They, if they give this to you in an in a exam, you must be able to label it. So let's start from the outside and work our way in. So the first thing we're going to have is this shell. Okay, so there's the shell and it's a porous shell. It must be porous so oxygen and carbon dioxide can go in and out. Okay. Our next layer here is going to be a double membrane. Now, if you've ever cracked an egg open, and you, um, as you break it, and you, you just break the shell, and if you peel pieces of the shell away, you'll see that there's a very thick white membrane that's right inside that shell. Um, if you have a boiled egg, you have to first peel that membrane away to actually get to the yolk and the white of the egg. Okay, so there's that double membrane, very important. Now that double membrane forms a little air bag here. The egg is not always perfectly round. It will always have a narrower end. That narrower side is where your air sac is going to be and it's for gaseous exchange. That's why the air is there. Okay, next layer, oh hang on, let's go through this here. Now this is the shalaz and again, if you take an egg, please do this. Go and take an egg when we finished here and break it open. And you'll see there are parts of the yolk, the, uh, the white of the egg, that's all like stringy and it's thicker. Now that's the shalaza, all right? And that's, its function is to stabilize the egg. So it sits on both sides and it stabilizes the yolk in the middle of the egg. Then we have this next layer, okay? And that's your corian. Now remember we went through the corian. The corian transfers nutrients and the nutrients are going to go from the yolk of the egg and the white of the egg is going to be feeding this poor little embryo or this little thing that's growing here. Okay, there's your yolk sac, sits around here. Um, the yolk full of nutrients, lots of protein, and between the white and the yolk of the egg, it contains 18 of the known amino acids to man. So you have an egg, it is very, very, very nutrient rich, especially in protein. All right, now, um, our next layer in, okay, so you've got the corian um, and you've got the yolk sac and now we look at, there's our little embryo and the embryo is in the little amniotic cavity and there's your amnion. Your amnion sits all the way around here and it protects this little thing that's growing here. Okay, so the amnion's to protect and then we have extra um, um, embryonic sulom, which is a sulom is a cavity and then we have this bag here and this bag over here let's just color it in that bag over there is the allantois and the allantois is for, repara for respiration and also stores a whole bunch of waste in there so there's the corian transfers nutrients there's the um, amnion or the amniotic cavity and the amnion's function to protect and the allantois for respiration and waste. And there you have your amniotic egg. All right, now, precocial uh, uh, pre and ultracial development. Precocial and ultracial. You have to know the difference between these two, please. So, um, hang on. Precocial. The young are mature 
and able to move directly after birth or hatching. So mature and they can move. So they can run if they have to. If they're able to fend for themselves and feed without parental care. So they're on their own. So think of a precocial egg would be um, a, a crocodile. Okay, Crocodile hatches and it's on its own. It doesn't matter where mommy and daddy are. And if mommy or daddy, or daddy finds it, daddy's going to eat it if he's hungry. So you must remember they need to be able to fend for themselves immediately. There's going to be no parental care here. Um, frogs, uh, those little tadpoles when they hatch, they also, undergo in, they also undergo metamorphosis, remember that? But they're there. And everything and anything's going to eat them if, they, if they're around. They need to be able to move and be ready to go. Then we have altricial. An altricial is the young are born helpless. They cannot protect or fend for themselves. Okay, so there you'd think of an eagle. Um, those eagle babies, when they hatch, they have to be fed. Um, think of a kitten, a cat's having kittens. All right, they have to be looked after. Dogs, us, we give birth, the babies are, are at trick hill. They cannot, they, they cannot fend for themselves. They must be looked after. They are helpless. Precocial, they are definitely mature and they can move directly after birth. They can run. All right, now examples. Insects, amphibians, fish, reptiles, some bird species like ducks, chickens, geese, and plovers are precocial. They can move. They move from the time, I mean, a little baby chick can't move very fast, but it can still move around. It can still run away from you. Bird species like doves and finches and hawks, eagles, and all mammals, all mammals are altricial. Because remember, mammals feed their babies. They feed them with breast milk. All right, so they've got to suckle and they've got to grow and develop until they are now on their own and they are able to move. All right, parental care. Parents look after the offspring to divide comfort and warmth and feed them and etc. Now in insects and fish and amphibians and reptiles, there is no parental care, people, nothing. They actually have their babies and it's good luck to you, hun. Make it, don't make it, it's not my problem. <coughs> Your precocial and altricial birds you're going to have parental care. Even precocial, so you've got your little chicks and your ducks, and they, they hatch and they run around and they can do their own thing, they can move. But you'll still see the little ducks follow, ducklings follow the, following their mom because they teach them how to survive. The same with little baby chicks. They're with their mommy hen, and the mommy hen teaches them how to survive. All right, even though they are able to move. Mammals, long periods of protective nurturing where social behavior and, social and survival techniques are taught. By the way, elephants are like humans. They also, just as a snippet of useless information, they also take their babies, baboons, uh, monkeys, your, all your primates. They teach them social skills so they learn this is allowed, that isn't allowed. If you do this, you're going to irritate mommy and daddy, and until you get to be an adult, you may not do ABC. The same with lions. Um, mammals are like that. We look after our babies, and then once they're ready, we set them, okay, off you go. Flowers is reproductive structures. Okay, angiosperm means flowering plants. You must know this. Angiosperm plants produce food, for humans and for animals and for insects. Why? Because when they produce their flowers, they produce fruit. And we eat the fruit and we eat seeds. Okay, flowering structures, we have the male and female reproductive structures. Some angiosperms do not have colorful flowers. People remember wheat, maize, rice, grass. Can you see the little flower structures on grass? No, you can't. Angiosperms are able to reproduce sexually and asexually. So what I've got here is a picture of um, uh, apple blossoms and they look beautiful and these little blossoms every single one of them is going to produce a fruit and the fruit will be your apple that you eat. Okay basic structure of a flower this is just revision you have your receptacle you have your sepals the petals which are colorful here you have the gynoecium 
and the gynoecium of the female is going to have the ovule which is going to develop into uh, which is going to contain the egg cell okay um, you have the uh, the male structure, which is the film, uh, the stamen, which is made up of the filament, and the anther. And in the anther is where we're going to produce the pollen grains, and the pollen grains are then going to fall onto the uh, stigma of the, the female structure or the gynoecium. The pollen grains then grow down a tube and in through the micropyle to the ovule to fertilize the structure. So remember the males have a, have a stamen which is made up of a filament and an anther. The female is the gynoecium. We have the stigma, the style and the ovary. Pollination. Now before fertilization, pollination must take place. And pollination, this is your definition. You've got to know this. Okay? It is the transfer of ripe pollen to a receptive stigma. This receptive stigma means that the, recept the, the stigma is ready to receive pollen. Okay, it's ready to receive pollen. So the pollen is transferred by animals and birds and insects and water, etc. Okay, peeps, we have two types of pollination. We have self-pollination and cross-pollination. Now remember, self-pollination, it's going to be pollen going onto a stigma on the same flower. Okay, so the anther is going to produce pollen when the stigma is ready. So it's going to be receptive. And the pollen from that same flower drops onto that stigma and it then grows. The pollen tubes will grow down to fertilize the little eggs, okay, or egg cells. So it's the same flower or the receptive stigma of a flower on the same parent plant. So you're going to have it. That's your self-fertilization. This flower is going to fertilize itself, okay. It's self-pollination. Whereas cross-pollination, you're transferring pollen from the anther of one plant to a receptive stigma of another plant of the same species. Okay, so it's not the same plant. It's different plants. All right. So the pollen will go from here, self-pollination, to its own stigma, or pollen from here will go onto a flower of the same plant. Then it's self-pollination. Cross-pollination, this plant will send, or uh, 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 fert the pollen from here will fertilize that plant. And pollen from this plant will fertilize this, fl the, uh, this plant. So that's cross-pollination. And how do we get cross-pollination to occur? You've got sp insects, and they specialize for f f um, feeding on flowers. They like normally like the nectar. So they're in search of the nectar, and as they're rubbing around, the pollen rubs off on them. Okay, and they've also, these insects specialized for flower feeding have appeared in fossil records almost, now look at this, at the same time as flowering plants started. So that adaptation developed when flowering plants were around. Um, this means that flowering plants evolved so too did the insects that pollinate them. Why? Because these flowering plants that are cross-pollinated cannot pollinate if insects aren't around, but they also rely on wind for cross-pollination, water for cross-pollination, etc. And this is a little picky of a uh, little bee, and the bees after the nectar, which is in here. But as the bee's busy mushing around here, there's your ripe stigma. As it's busy fiddling around you to get to the nectar, it's rubbing the pollen. I'm not sure if you can actually see this, but you've got little pollen grains all over here are little pollen grains that have rubbed off on this little insect. Now this little bee is going to go to another flower, and as it's busy rummaging around there to get the nectar, that pollen is going to rub off onto the ripe stigma. Okay, question two. An investigation was done to determine the role of petals in, plant, in, in insect pollination, uh, pollination in um, apple flowers. When the flowers are self-pollinated, the pollen tube grows a little into the stigma and style and fertilization does not take place. In other words, 
your apple pl plants or your apple flowers don't like self-pollination. Now, we want cross-pollination and what do you think is going to attract insects to a plant? It's got to have pretty flowers, it's got to have nectar, it may have bee, li bee guides, etc. All of these things are going to make or ensure cross-pollination. The stigmas are going to have to be over here so they can be touched. So, 10 flowers with petals and 10 flowers without petals were used. So petals and no petals. Why? If they've got no petals, are the bees attracted to them? After two days, the flowers are prevented from further pollination. After seven days, the extent of pollination and fertilization was recorded. The diagrams below show what you saw. Now here's the flower with petals, here's the flower without petals. Okay, no petals, going to battle with attraction to the bees. Now the results are shown in the table below. So what we've got, pollen on the stigma, if it had petals, lots compared to 25. Pollen tubes, this could just have been because of wind. Pollen tubes in the style, 86, and shame here, only 8 developed. Ovules fertilized, 38, and shame, only 4. So you see here it's a little bit less than 50%, and here it is about 50%. Give an explanation for the presence of more pollen on the stigmas of the flowers with petals than on the flowers without petals. People, very, very easy. Why? Because um, the flowers that had petals, I'm just going to write here because you're running out of time. Petals are going to attract insects. Okay. And your petal, the, the um, flowers without petals, so no petals. Okay, you're going to have to write this out nicely in an exam, but no petals, no attracting, no attracting insects. Okay, then question two. Explain why there are more pollen tubes present in the styles of both types of flowers than the number of ovules fertilized. Why? Well, firstly, remember that you, the, the um, pollen tube must grow down the style okay um, so that's important now when it is cell fertilization occurs you're only going to have the growth of a of a little a little bit of growth so pollen tube is to grow down so for self Pollination, okay, only some growth, okay, um, not all pollen tubes reach the ovary, okay. State three ways in which this investigation could be improved. Now, they love asking this. They love to ask ways to improve this experiment or, or this investigation. How would you do it? Number one, you repeat. Okay? You repeat the investigation and use average. So you, you repeat it five or six times and you use an average always. Okay? Um, you can increase sample size. Because remember, the greater your sample size, the more accurate you're going to be. You can use um, the same size flowers. You can use the same color flowers. Because they didn't tell us that they used the same color flowers. You can use uh, um, f flowers from the same tree. Okay, um, people, you can carry on and on and on here. At, at the end of the day, you must know how you would al always make sure you have a greater sample size. Make sure that, you, that they're from the same plants or the same animals. So in other words, the same species, the same parent, etc. You're always going to make it more accurate. And if you increase your numbers, 
always, always more accurate. Fertilization. Now, once pollination has taken place, double fertilization will take place. One male gamete fuses with the female gamete in the ovary, and that forms the diploid zygote. Okay? The ovule develops into the seed. Now, you must know this. The ovule develops into the seed. And the seed coat, or the tester, develops from the integument of the ovule. So the ovule is responsible for the seed. And sitting inside the ovule is the egg cell. And that's the egg cell that is now a diploid zygote. The ovary grows into the fruit. So every time you eat fruit, you're eating the ovary. The second male gamete fuses with the two polar nuclei. So that's haploid with the two polar nuclei, because there'll be two of them, and that forms N plus N plus N is 3N, which is a triploid endosperm, and that provides the nutrition for that developing embryo. Okay, seeds. The seed is a structure that surrounds this and protects and nourishes the embryonic plant, in other words, the little embryo, until there are leaves and it is able to photosynthesize. Now, people, you've got to know, gymnosperm means naked seed. Okay, so these seeds are not covered by fruit and are instead closed by the scales of a cone. Now, you know what a pine cone looks like? Think about that pine cone. Those, those pieces of the pine cone are what protects those seeds because they are naked. In an angiosperm, okay, which is flowering plants, angiosperm also actually means enclosed seeds. So the seeds are protected by the fruit. Now think of eating an apple. When you bite into an apple and you eat that around the core, in that core is where you have those capsule-like structures. And then you've got, those, those are the integuments, and then inside you've got your little seeds. And in the seed is your little embryo. Significance of seeds you must know. Okay, what do seeds do? They are a product of sexual reproduction, and what do they do? They give us genetic variation because haploid plus haploid equals diploid. That's from the male, and that's from the female. All right, it provides nourishment. Why? It provides nourishment for the, oh heavens, we've lost the E there. The embryo food is stored in the tissue called the endosperm. Where did the endosperm come from? From double fertilization. Okay? It allows the embryos to be dispersed to another location because sometimes, remember, seeds have got all kinds of modifications in them. They'll have hooks. So they'll hook onto the fur of animals and the animal will walk along and then it'll lie down and the seed will fall off. It'll, it'll dislodge and fall off. Um, so there are lots of ways. You've got wind that will carry some seeds. Um, water will carry some of the seeds, but they are dispersed to go everywhere. Um, protect. Big thing is they protect the embryo. Why? They encase it and they put it into a condition where the seed is then dormant. You, some places with seed banks, they can keep seeds for, for hundreds of years as long as they're kept in the correct conditions. All right, a seed will only develop if you take it and put it into a nice, warm, dark, wet, moist place. Only then will a seed grow. Okay, ensure survival of the species as each plant produces many seeds, so survival. So let's look at these again. If I was setting an exam, I'd ask you this. Okay, significance. First of all, they're from sexual reproduction, so they provide genetic variation. Okay, they provide nourishment because of the endosperm and double fertilization to the little embryo. They allow the embryos to be dispersed so that there is no competition to the parent plant. They protect the embryo until they are ready to grow and they ensure the survival of every single species on this planet. Okay, importance of the seeds as a food source. Now people, think about it. Seeds are important because we eat them. Now look at what we've got here. We've got peas and soya beans. Soya beans are very rich in protein. And soya beans are what a lot of vegetarians use in place of meat. Okay, lentils, oats, nuts, green beans, and they're all rich, very rich in proteins. Cereals like wheat and maize and rice, they're the staple food for many people, so they, they form staple food. Um, 
sorghum is used as a product to make traditional beer. I mean, what would we do without sorghum in South Africa? Sunflower and, and, and peanut seeds are used for cooking and salad oils. Now, they are, remember, some people are allergic to peanuts, but it's still for cooking and salads. Okay, seed banks. This is our last slide, and just bear with me. We almost finished with our little flowers. Okay, seed banks. What is a seed bank? A seed bank's exactly like a bank we keep our money in. And what does it do? It maintains biodiversity. Bio means biological. And diversity means differences. So it makes sure that the biological differences in the world are maintained. And we take them and we stick them in these banks. In this case, it's going to be a seed bank. Seeds are stored in, now please look at this, a cool, dry, sterile conditions. Now if it's not sterile, they're going to be destroyed by bacteria. It must be cool because what do, the, what do seeds like to develop? Seeds like it to be dark and warm and moist. Those are your three things to get a seed to grow, dark and warm and moist. So what do we do here? We make it cool, so it's not warm. We make it dry, so there's no moisture. And we make sure it's sterile, so there's no bacteria eating it. And they kept it between minus 10 and minus 20 degrees Celsius, which, which may cause damage to the DNA in some plant species, but in most not. Okay, seeds of most species remain viable, means that they can be used. Viable can be used. For more than, look at this, a hundred years in those conditions. Seed banks can be used to store seeds when crops, a, a crop yield is high, okay? And we've now, there have been a lot of seeds produced, lots of crops, so they take some of those crops and they put them in the seed bank. So the next year when it's a lean crop, they can go and get the seeds, all right? When there is a need later, like there's a natural disaster, or there's a drought, volcanic eruption, etc., or there's disease and pestilence, they can then be released and planted. Seed banks are also used when the species is listed as rare or endangered. Okay, why? So that we can protect our biodiversity on our planet. Now people, this is all very, very important. Seed banks, like gene banks, we need to keep them. Why? Because somebody somewhere will do something stupid one day and we're going to end up with a whole bunch of issues and we're going to end up with a whole bunch of, of organisms that will no longer be. So we need seed banks just like we need gene banks so that we can remember that's what it looked like and that's what it is. All right. Well, that's it for today. Not very exciting unless you're a true botanist, um, but that's all about sexual and asexual reproduction in plants and insects and your lower organisms. Have an awesome afternoon. Until next time, we'll see you here. Bye.